Hello, and welcome back to the advanced webinar, Integrating Remote Sensing into a Water Quality Monitoring Program. We are on part two of the webinar series with the theme of water quality of larger inland water bodies. My name is Sherry Palacios, and my co-instructor is Amita Mehta. We are excited to have our guest speaker, Dr. Daniela Gerlin, from the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. She will be presenting the work she is doing to monitor water quality in the lakes of the U.S. state of Wisconsin, and she will be on at the end to answer your questions. We understand that we have a diverse audience of participants. We hope that each of you will come away from this series with some new knowledge and skill related to the remote sensing of aquatic systems and how it can complement a larger water quality monitoring program. Let's get started. The objectives of this training are to learn to understand which data products are used for water quality monitoring, follow rigorous practices for obtaining and processing aquatic remote sensing data, and to build skills in image processing for water quality monitoring for coastal and inland water bodies using NASA's CDAS image processing software. Last week, we focused on coastal systems. And this week, we are focusing on water quality of larger inland water bodies. Our plan for today is to review some of the material from part one last week, talk about water quality monitoring in freshwater systems, give an overview of sensors and data products that are appropriate for freshwater systems, provide some examples of water quality monitoring programs in freshwater systems, and then we'll have our guest speaker, Dr. Gerlin, from the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources give her presentation titled, Integrating Remote Sensing into a Water Quality Monitoring Program. Following Daniela's presentation, Amita will demonstrate data access, atmosphere correction, and processing to level two for Landsat 8 OLI imagery. First, highlights from part one. NASA's Applied Remote Sensing Training Program seeks to increase the use of Earth science observations and decision making through training for policymakers, environmental managers, and other professionals in the public and private sector. We work to help professionals solve problems on such topics as harmful algal blooms, flooding, deforestation, and wildfires. RSET strives to provide the community with relevant trainings. We are always open to new ideas and suggestions. At the end of this course, you will be given a survey. Please be sure to fill it in. Much of the material and direction of this webinar series was guided by the survey responses provided to the most recent advanced water quality training offered in September of 2018. Please give us your feedback in the survey at the end of the webinar series. We want to provide useful webinar or in-person trainings to the community. In this table, we have provided a rough mapping of which in-situ observations correspond to which satellite observations. Please know that these are not an exact match. It would be important for your water quality monitoring program to validate satellite to in-situ observations to have an understanding of how well a satellite estimates the in-situ value. This range of understanding, or what we call an uncertainty estimate, would then give you a frame of reference for how well the satellite observes the parameter and could guide you in decisions to modify satellite algorithms to more closely fit the water quality parameters in your region. Also remember that satellite remote sensing is meant to complement an in situ water quality program, not replace it. Also in the first part, we reviewed some current satellite missions that are used for water quality monitoring. We are in a golden age of remote sensing for water quality. This has left us with a long time series of observations. Please take a moment to look at each of these satellite missions. This is a rich data set to mine to understand current water quality questions and to begin to understand how aquatic systems have changed since the beginning of the time series. We reviewed a general workflow to use as a guide when developing a program that uses remote sensing. This workflow includes identifying your problem, evaluating if remote sensing can complement your in situ sampling effort, taking the time to choose sensors and appropriate data products for your problem, building a strategy for coincident in situ and remote sensing observations, 
and using a parallel effort of in situ collection coincident with overflight of the imager, processing in situ and imagery samples, and comparison of in situ observations with the estimates of corresponding data products using statistical methods, followed by the communication of results to the stakeholder. If a program involves the creation of remote sensing algorithms, this in situ validation can be extensive. Even after the algorithm is developed, it's important to remember that ground truthing or sea truthing or water surface truthing in this case is an important part of an ongoing water quality monitoring program. This workflow is a general guide and is not meant as a one size fits all approach to incorporating remote sensing measurements into a water quality monitoring program. Each program will have its unique characteristics. We would like to remind you that you, if you would like to receive a certificate of completion, you have homework due, and it's due on June 21st, the Friday of the third week of the webinar series. To answer the questions of the homework, you need to complete the part one exercise. After finishing the exercise, follow the above link to the Google form for the homework. This link is also on the webinar series website. Let's talk a little bit more about water quality and freshwater systems. For example, what are some of the goals of monitoring in freshwater systems? Some goals may be to monitor for cyanobacteria, pathogens like E. coli, man-made pollutants, excess nutrient inputs, and water clarity. Why might one want to monitor for these? Some examples are to understand impacts to drinking water systems, to water available to livestock and other domestic animals, impacts to wildlife, and to the entire ecosystem. Please take a moment to look at the images along the bottom of this slide. On the far left is a colorized scanning electron micrograph of E. coli, which is found in feces, and when present in drinking water can cause severe illness in humans. The image to the right of it shows the toxic cyanobacterium microcystis. Well, a cup of microcystis, as you see in this image, is a rather non-traditional way to represent the cyanohab organism. This image shows actual cell densities that can be found in lakes and reservoirs. Even at very low density, much lower than you see here, microcystis can produce toxins that are hazardous. These toxins can cause liver failure and can kill very quickly. The image next to that is one of plastic microbeads. We are only now learning how harmful these can be in the environment to humans, domestic, domesticated animals, wildlife, and ecosystems. And very little has been successfully done with respect to remote sensing of these. It's an area of ongoing research. Next to the microbeads image is an image of a dog swimming in the microcystis bloom. This can be quite dangerous to dogs and other domestic animals and wildlife as they groom themselves and the licking of the fur or feathers can be a conduit for the toxin into the animal system. On the right of that, birds tend to be less affected by microcystis, but they can transport it from one water body to the next. What are some typical in situ observations for monitoring freshwater systems? A lot depends on what the particular problem is for your region of interest. Typical observations include chlorophyll concentration, water temperature, water clarity, nutrients, metals, pH, and alkalinity, dissolved organic matter, phytoplankton taxonomy, cyanobacteria, indicator species like E. coli, um, suspended sediments, E. coli listed here, and plastics. Which remote sensing data products are relevant for freshwater systems? Again, much depends on what the particular problem is for your region of interest. Remote sensing data products can include chlorophyll concentration, water surface temperature, light absorption by CDOM, diffuse attenuation coefficient or the decay rate of light through the water column, water clarity, cyanobacterial index, which we'll talk about a little bit more today, spectral signatures for particular phytoplankton groups, and user-defined algorithms developed for a particular region. In part one, we reviewed satellite missions that are used for water quality monitoring. Which ones of these are best for freshwater systems and why? 
a lot comes down to the issue of resolution, spatial, temporal, and spectral resolution. One of the major considerations for freshwater systems is the size of the body of water. For large lake systems, such as the Great Lakes in the US or Lake Victoria in Africa, modus and veers are adequate. Yes, they have coarse spatial resolution, but they have the frequent, frequent revisit rate and spectral resolution well suited to dynamic lacustrine systems that may change over the course of hours or days. For smaller lakes, like the ones our guest speaker, Dr. Gerlin, will describe today, the finer spatial resolution afforded by Landsat 8 OLI, Sentinel-2 MSI, or Sentinel-3 OLCHI, enables sampling of smaller water bodies. Even with lower spectral resolution data, these sensors can still be used to derive meaningful data products for the water monitoring of lake ecosystems. Dr. Gerland's work with the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources uses these sensors and a custom-built algorithm to understand water quality in lakes of her state. One of the key drivers for monitoring water quality in freshwater systems is to monitor for cyanobacterial harmful algal blooms, or cyanohabs, in waterways used for drinking water. These cyanohabs can be quite disruptive, and water resource managers are vigilant in the monitoring of their presence. Why are they so disruptive? Cyanobacteria are such a problem because they can produce toxins, produce blooms of extremely high cell density and so suck up the oxygen, and they thrive in warmer temperatures. So as climate changes and water temperatures increase, cyanobacterial blooms will continue to rise. Cyanobacteria are not always harmful, but they can be harmful. Please take a moment to look at the table below. It was adapted from a previous RSET webinar from a presentation by Richard Stump. Moving from the left column to the right, you see a list of culprit cyanobacteria genera. If it forms colonies or filaments, if it forms surface scums, and which toxins it might produce. This is a lot of information to take in. Many of these genera are cosmopolitan, meaning they can be found globally. I'd like to direct your eye to the column titled surface scum. Why might we wish to highlight that one, that column? The reason is that surface scums are emergent, meaning they ride at the surface of the water and often do not have much water overlying them. This means that remote sensing reflectance in the near infrared and shortwave infrared can be exploited in remote sensing algorithms to detect these genera. Please look at the colony or filament column. column. Whether a genus forms amorphous globules or straw-like bundles, even at a microscopic scale, can have a big impact on optical backscattering spectra. Remember, backscattering is one of the inherent optical properties in the remote sensing reflectance function. The difference in globules versus straw bales may be just enough for the spectral signal, signal of one genus, like microcystis, a globule, to be different enough from the spectral signature of a feminamazon that the two can be distinguished from each other. For example, in lake systems, and I'm just going to call it AFLOS, in lake systems where AFLOS always precedes the highly toxic microcystis, the remote sensing observations of AFLOS could be used to forecast microcystis blooms. Cyanobacteria occur naturally and are often not harmful. Sometimes toxic ones form dangerous blooms, some of which can be detected using remote sensing observations. It is important to be clear upfront, satellites cannot detect toxins. In fact, it is unlikely that the current suite of multispectral satellites can effectively discriminate among cyanobacterial genera. Satellites readily detect cyanobacteria that form surface scums, and algorithms that use data in the red and infrared portions of the spectrum are currently in use today. Some algorithms are able to detect optical features diagnostic of phytoplankton or cyanobacteria, these include algorithms for chlorophyll, scattering at 709 and 779 nanometers, 
and light absorption by phycocyanin at 620 nanometers. Currently in use are a number of algorithms that use the spectral signature of cyanobacteria. These work fine without atmosphere correction as they use information about the relative differences in the peaks and troughs of the spectra. The algorithm commonly used in the US and Europe is the Cyanobacteria Index, or CI. It was developed for the European Space Agency's MARIS sensor. It is currently used with the Sentinel-3 sensor and has been adapted for MODIS. The Cyanobacteria Index does not require a surface scum, but it can work with it. It is less sensitive to sediment and water vapor in the atmosphere. The reason for this is that sediment and water vapor and aerosols more strongly affect the spectrum in the blue to green part of the visible spectrum, so about 400 to 600 nanometers. As you can see in the plot below, the algorithm is using values at around 681 nanometers, so a part of the spectrum that is not competing for light with sediments and water vapor or aerosols. The CI is an indicator of cell density and it is equivalent to the spectral shape at 681 nanometers. Please look at the plot below. I'd like for you to draw your eye to this region here of the spectrum. You see this dashed line, I'm gonna call that the slope line. And this is a vertical line from 681. So this um, right here where my cursor is, is at about 681 nanometers. The spectrum that is the darker dotted line is the one of a bloom condition. It is also the one here that has a higher magnitude of normalized water leaving radiance, a different um, unit of measure that is, is similar to remote sensing reflectance. The algorithm works by plotting the slope between 665 nanometers and 709 nanometers. You can see that the dashed line here and an orange arrow denoting the vertical distance from this slope line to the magnitude of the spectrum at 681 nanometers. In this case, the spectrum is below the slope line. It is negative. A negative line indicates a cyanobacterial bloom condition. The non-bloom condition, the spectrum that you see below with the blue arrow, has a positive line at 681. Sometimes the most effective algorithms are ones that seem the most obvious, like is the case with the CI. As a person who develops algorithms, I have to confide that this obviousness only seems to emerge after the algorithm is developed. A lot of hard work goes into building these and especially to validating them so that we may have confidence that they work. Here you see the cyanobacterial index from a NASA MODIS aqua image collected on August 11th, 2018. Gray indicates clouds or missing data. The scale bar along the left gives a relative amount of cell density. This is the southwest corner of Lake Erie, one of the Great Lakes found along the US-Canada border. Here you see that there is a high concentration of cyanobacteria in this southwest region. Sandusky Bay in particular, which uh, right here where I'm circling with my mouse, was a region of high concentrations of cyanobacteria. Lake Erie is a drinking water source for the people who live along the shore. Water resource managers are actively monitoring both in situ stations and remote sensing imagery in the form of the Lake Erie Hab Bulletin to determine if they should use the water from the lake. There are a number of NASA and NOAA funded research projects in the lake to improve our understanding of these cyanohabs and also our ability to detect them and forecast their emergence and movement. What are some cyanobacterial harmful algal bloom monitoring programs? The NOAA Operational Lake Erie Hab Bulletin is issued twice weekly and provides forecasts for where microcystis blooms are likely to occur in Lake Erie. And it's issued twice weekly during the period of the year when cyanobacterial blooms are most likely to occur, which is in summer and early autumn. 
Like a weather forecast, it predicts the severity of the bloom, and because it takes into consideration wind conditions and lake currents, reports the likelihood of vertical mixing and horizontal transport of the blooms. The bulletin provides resources for recreational users to visit to ascertain which beaches are safe for swimming. It's a straightforward and effective tool for communicating microcystis bloom conditions to the public as well as water resource managers. Another water quality monitoring program is the NOAA Experimental Lake Erie Hab Tracker. The Lake Erie Hab Tracker uses satellite earth observations of cyanobacterial blooms and models the movement of the blooms within the lake. Using wind observations and modeled current data, it predicts the location of cyanohabs in the lake up to five days in advance. Who uses the HAB Tracker? Water resource managers, anglers, beachgoers, and others who may wish to know where the blooms are so they can avoid the areas that are affected. The HAB Tracker provides users with predictions of cell concentration and location, and it is an effective tool at co quickly communicating where the safest places in the lake are to visit. Another water quality monitoring program is the NOAA Great Lakes Hyperspectral Monitoring Program. This program is intended to observe the presence of cyanobacterial blooms like the others. Research from this campaign is focused on discriminating among different cyanobacterial groups and diatoms in these optically complex lake waters. It's possible because the imagery that they're going to be using once they finish developing the phytoplankton cyanobacterial discrimination algorithm has enough data in it because it's hyperspectral data. This program is an airborne campaign, meaning the imagery is collected from an airplane. The flights occur regularly throughout the cyanobacteria bloom season of summer and early fall. They can occur during sunny conditions or during cloudy conditions because the airplane can fly under the clouds. So even on days when the satellite does not capture imagery, this program does. This program is meant to fill a gap. High spectral resolution imagery, I already mentioned that it's called hyperspectral imagery or imaging spectroscopy data, are collected weekly over Lake Erie and bi-weekly over Saginaw Bay and Lake Huron. Imagery is collected over drinking water intakes as well as other regions. The cyanobacteria index is computed using the imagery and a report is submitted to the water utility managers so that they may respond to any bloom events. Results are also reported to the US EPA and the governor of Ohio. In situ water measurements include instrument suites on moorings, as well as ship based surveys of whole water samples that coincide with the overflights. These in situ data are made available to the active research community working towards developing algorithms and deploying methods to better to monitor for microcystis blooms. This project is working towards building a three-dimensional HAB tracker that takes into consideration the horizontal movement of blooms, but also the vertical structure of the blooms. Since these blooms often form surface scums, there are periods when deeper water is safe for the intakes for the drinking water. A three-dimensional HAB tracker would help to determine if a bloom threatens a subsurface water intake. There is much promise in this program, and over the next couple of years, it will be interesting to learn more about how the hyperspectral imagery may reveal more about the taxonomy of the lake's phytoplankton and cyanobacteria. Finally, we have the Harmful Algal Blooms Analysis Tool. The satellite imagery analysis tool provides a screening level analysis to prompt field verification and sampling to confirm the status of a suspected cyanobacteria, harmful algal bloom, and presence of toxic species. Right now, this tool works only in the U.S. state of California and some water bodies in Oregon and Nevada near the border with California. It is a data visualization tool that computes the CI cyanobacterial index to estimate the concentration of cyanobacteria cells. 
Data are displayed in map form to show the spatial extent of the blooms and is also viewable in long and short timelines to show how concentrations vary over time. This data visualization tool enables the user to view imagery in a map view, but to also view the data in time series as you see in this image here. On the left, <clears throat> you can see the circle in the lower left. It surrounds the northern part of California, our location of interest. Within this circle, you see an orange square. This is the location of the lake of interest, in this example, Clear Lake. Contrary to its namesake, Clear Lake is not clear and has suffered from years of cyanobacteria blooms. And you can see this in time series plot in the upper right of the image. There's a lot to take in with the display of this tool. It is a lot of information for the beginning user. We encourage you to explore this tool using the link above Think about the imagery that goes into something like this. Think about the type of ground truth measurements are needed. Think about how this tool may communicate the results in a more direct manner than it may be right now. What are the advantages and disadvantages to using remote sensing for water quality monitoring in freshwater systems? Advantages include long time imagery record for time series analysis ongoing commitment from space agencies to continue data collection, reliable data for operational early warning and forecasting systems. Some sensors have spatial resolution appropriate for lakes, and imagery is typically freely available and of high quality. How about the disadvantages? <clears throat> Shallow water, interference from the bottom, that's a real disadvantage in these lake systems. Water bodies too small for the spatial resolution of sensors. A limited number of standard algorithms for these optically complex waters, and so a need to develop or customize algorithms for a particular region that can sometimes exceed the skill set of the person who's working with the remote sensing data. But it's also an opportunity to learn. Atmospheric correction. Highly variable systems, so they're highly dynamic even on short periods of time that are shorter than the revisit rate of the satellite and ground truthing can be quite costly. We have now come to the conclusion of our introduction to part two, water quality of larger inland water bodies lecture. We have reviewed the reasons for developing a water quality monitoring program in freshwater systems using remote sensing observations. We've discussed the cyanobacteria index data product as a commonly used cyanohab related data product, and we've explained how it is calculated. Finally, we have reviewed several water quality monitoring programs that use satellite imagery. Next up, Amita and I are very excited to have Dr. Daniela Gerland from the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources give us a guest talk about her work in algorithm development and monitoring water quality and productivity of small lakes in the state of Wisconsin in the US. Dr. Gerland reached out to us in the last year after participating in an RSET water quality webinar. She had some ideas about future in-person trainings for her region. After describing the extensive water quality monitoring program she is a part of in Wisconsin, we actually asked her to come and give a guest talk in our next webinar series. So, we, so she asked for training from us, but we were so excited about her work, we wanted her to come and talk to you. So we welcome you, Dr. Gerlin, as our guest speaker. We hope our participants on this series get as much out of your talk as we have. Thank you for volunteering to participate in our webinar series and giving back to the community of water resource managers who wish to learn more about using remote sensing in their programs. Thank you. Hello, my name is Daniela Gerlin, and I will present on the an integrating remote sensing into a water quality monitoring program. I would like to start out to describe some of the remote sensing challenges we discover in the remote sensing of optically complex waters. Afterwards, I would like to describe some of the Earth observation sensors we currently use at the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. And then I would like to describe some of our remote sensing activities. I would like to present some details on the satellite water quality monitoring and the data used for integrated reporting. 
and the data dissemination. And I would like to finish with an overview of some of our remote sending research projects. There are many advantages and disadvantages to the remote sending of water quality. And remote sending provides water quality data with a high spatial and temporal resolution for thousands of lakes at a time. And this is especially true for the northern part of the state of Wisconsin, where we actually have two to 3,000 lakes in one Landsat 8 satellite image. Remote sending helps with the evaluation of environmental problems and potential health risks. And it provides historical data for studies of trends in water quality. Remote sending provides near real-time data for integration into early warning systems to protect the public from harmful algae blooms. There are a number of disadvantages associated with the remote sending of water quality though. Lakes and reservoirs are typically optically complex, which means that we have a lot of different optically active constituents, which concentrations differ independent of each other. We might see interference from the lake bottom we might see dynamic changes in water quality, which are within a couple of hours for some of the lakes and within several days for other lakes. And remote sending is limited to a number, small number of water quality parameters of interest. It means we can retrieve any water quality parameters which are related to um, some sort of color in the remotely sensed data. Remote sending typically requires a collection of ground truth data for the development of algorithms. The Earth observation sensors we currently use at the Wisconsin DNR include Landsat 7, Landsat 8, Sentinel 2, and Sentinel 3. We routinely use Landsat 7 and Landsat 8 um, to retrieve the water clarity for the lakes across the state, and we use Sentinel 2 and Sentinel 3 for some of our smaller research projects. The different satellite sensors come with their different advantages and disadvantages. Landsat 7 and Landsat 8 have a relatively high spatial resolution of 15 meters. They have very wide spectral bands and only a limited number of bands, so which makes them mostly suitable to estimate overall water quality parameters like the water clarity. Sentinel 2 has some additional spectral bands, which are relevant for the remote sensing of chlorophyll A concentrations. And Sentinel-3 has several additional spectral bands, which is relevant for the remote sensing of several con constituents of interest. The disadvantage of Sentinel-3 data is the large pixel size of 300 times 300 meters, which means the data is only suitable for larger lakes. The signal the satellite measures and the signal we're interested in is the remote sensing reflectance. So remote sensing reflectance is the ratio of the water leaving radiance, the light that comes up from the water surface, to the down billing irradiance, the light that comes down from the sky. So remote sensing reflectance is dependent on the solar zenith angle, the solar azimuth angle, and the wavelengths. The remote sensing Reflectance is directly related to the absorption and scattering in the water column, which are represented by A for the absorption coefficient and BB for the backscattering coefficient. And the remote sensing reflectance is sensitive to variations in the solar zenith angle and the bidirectional properties of the reflectance, which is represented by the ratio of F over Q. The signal we are actually interested in is the absorption by different types of particles represented by A. We have A phi for the absorption by phytoplankton, which is related to chlorophyll A concentrations. A nup, the absorption by non algal particles. A sedum, the absorption by colored dissolved organic matter. And A water and C. Um, idea of the remote sensing of water quality is to separate these different absorption coefficients and retrieve them and relate them to the constitutions of interest. <coughs> if we look at a typical reflectance spectrum from one of our lakes, from Lake Winnebago, we can see that the different constituents absorb at different wavelengths. And we have absorption by chlorophylls, carotenoids, non-algal particles, and sedum in the blue spectral region. Then a very specific absorption maximum of cyano phycocyanin at 630 nanometers and one by chlorophyll A at around 670 nanometers and several characteristic peaks related to scattering by total suspended matters 
at 710 nanometers and 820 nanometers. This is a spectrum that's very typical for turbid waters with algae blooms, and especially the scattering related peak at 820 nanometers is only found in very turbid conditions. If you look at the next slide, we can see um, um, the way the spectrum looks overlaid with the spectral band locations of several different satellite sensors, and we can see that Landsat 7 and Landsat 8 have very wide spectral bands, which means a lot of the spectral detail of the reflectance, reflectance spectrum is averaged out. Sentinel 2A has some additional bands, and they are a little more narrow. Bands 4 and 5 are in the appropriate spectral regions for the remote sending of chlorophyll A concentrations, and when we look at Sentinel 3, we see very narrow spectral bands and a very high number of spectral bands. We have band number seven in the relevant spectral region for the remote sensing of phycocyanin. We have bands eight to 10 in the relevant spectral regions for the remote sensing of chlorophyll A, and then, of course, band 11, where the TSS cause scattering peak is. The remote sensing activities at Service Consent DNR include the systematic retrieval of the water clarity from Landsat 7 ETM plus and Landsat 8 OLE TIS data then the studies of major drivers of lake water quality, the interactions and the potential impacts of land use and climate on water clarity, and then we concentrate on an increase in Earth observation monitoring capabilities through the optical and biogeochemical characterization of lakes in support of algorithm calibration, refinement, and validation. The graph to the right shows the number of satellite retrieved water clarity measurements from 1999 when the project started to 2015, the latest data we currently have is a 2070 data, and we retrieve around 7,000 to 10,000 average water clarity values for each year. The project started with a research project at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 1999, where they first related the um, Landsat data to um, Secchi depth measurements, which were taken on the ground on satellite image acquisition dates, and the process has changed little since the Wisconsin DNR continued to process the data. Citizen Lake Monitoring Network volunteers collect SECIDEPS measurements on satellite image acquisition dates. Then the Landsat images for these dates are processed, and the measurements are related to the spectral values found in the image. There is a multiple linear regression step to relate the satellite and ground truth data, and then the same model is applied to the satellite images to derive maps of lake water clarity. The data is then used for the Wisconsin Water Quality Report to Congress, and the data is disseminated through different online outlets. The example shown is a 2016 satellite retrieval of the water clarity. It starts with the pre-processing and mosaicing of Landsat 7 and 8 images, followed by the extraction of field data signatures from these images. The next step is the multiple linear regression of field and satellite data, followed by the retrieval of the water clarity from Landsat images. The software packages used for the 2016 data included ArcGIS 10.41 for desktop, NV 5.40, IDL 8.60, R for Windows, and R Studio. The software packages change depending on updates with every year of image processing. The right side of the slide shows the image processing steps in a little more detail, and these image processing steps are all performed in NV at this point in time. I typically download the Landsat Collection 1 Level 1 data, and I convert the image digital numbers to top of atmosphere reflectance, which is the input product for the um, currently used cloud and cloud shadow removal algorithm in NV. The images are reprojected to Wisconsin Transfers Mercator, which is a standard coordinate system for all the state of Wisconsin data products. In the next step, land and residual clouds are removed through a near infrared threshold, and afterwards, shallow waters, aquatic vegetation, and lake edges are identified and removed through an unsupervised classification. In the last step, mosaic rasters are built for images which are acquired on the same image acquisition dates, which in the case of Wisconsin is a mosaic of three, up to three images. The left of this slide shows one of the image processing steps in more detail. It shows removal of edge effects for Lake Winnebago, 
And this step is performed through an unsupervised classification. The little charts show the spectra for the shoreline of Lake Winnebago, which was removed in the step, and an algae bloom in Lake Winnebago, which was maintained in the image. The areas marked in red in the image of Lake Winnebago are the areas that were removed through the unsupervised classification. And you can see that these areas are mainly the border the areas around clouds, which are areas with increased haze. And then there's a thin red line at the shoreline. And this line actually represents boat docks in Lake Winnebago. So it represents mixed pixels of water and boat docks. The model for the satellite retrieval of the water clarity is very simple. It's still the same one used since 1999. And it uses basically a ratio of the blue Landsat 8 oliband over the red Landsat 8 Oli band. In 2016, I processed 76 Landsat 7 and 8 images. I used 11 image mosaics for the algorithm development and 608 ground truth measurements for the algorithm development. This effort resulted in 9,750 water clarity estimates for 2016. And water clarity estimates means that is the average water clarity for each lake. So we don't extract the water clarity for individual stations within a lake. We calculate the average water clarity for each lake. So these are basically values for 9,750 different lakes at different dates and times. And so this resulted in 4,500 water bodies. So about two measurements for each water body. The average mean abs normalized absolute error was two feet or 60 centimeters. Most of our lakes had water clarities from about four to 16 feet. This data is then used for the integrated reporting. And the integrated reporting is um, reporting to fulfill the federal requirements for statewide water quality condition reporting. And for this, water quality standards are used to define goals for our water bodies through use designations, use protection, and water quality protection. And the water quality monitoring data is used to assess the current status of the water body. They are general and specific assessments. The report combines these two assessments, and which results in the title integrated reporting. The designated uses are classified into four categories, which are aquatic life, recreation, public health and welfare, and wildlife. The general condition assessment include multiple metrics and the Carlson's Trophic State Index, which is one of the most commonly used indices of lake productivity, is one of these metrics. The Carlson Trophic State Index is calculated from chlorophyll A or SACIDEPS at the Wisconsin DNR, which includes the satellite inferred SACI depths. And it is calculated automatically with a programming package. The equation for this is shown on the right. The calculation of the um, Carson Traffic State Index in the, R programming, or in the programming package requires a minimum of three um, water quality measurements for each summer. The data we have is disseminated through the lakes and aquatic invasive species in addition to its use in the integrated reports. For this, I create a water clarity composite for each year to show the average summer water clarity for each lake. And the um, Landsat images for this water clarity composite are selected dependent on the accuracy of the satellite water clarity retrieval and the um, coverage of the actually images after the removal of clouds to reduce the number of image artifacts we can see in the viewer. You can see in the screenshot that we are looking at Landsat 7 data for this map. Landsat 7 data is typically more noisy, which is caused by the difference in the signal to noise ratio. And you can see from the noise within the individual lakes that it is suitable to calculate the average water clarity for a lake but it is less suitable to extract the data for individual stations. The second outlet we use to share the data is the Wisconsin DNR Open Data Portal. And you can find the same data sets in the Wisconsin DNR Open Data Portal and actually download the data sets. And you only have to search for satellite water clarity. Our remote sensing research project 
let's um, focus on the development of new Earth observation monitoring capabilities. And therefore, we, Steve Grab and I collected a lot of field data in summer and fall 2014 and 2015 to simulate the spectral bands of different satellites for algorithm development. We collected data at 32 lakes in Wisconsin. We collected a standard water quality data, radiometric data, and absorption and backscattering data, and we share this data if it is requested. Recently, we had some additional field data collections to support different partnerships in summer 2016 and 2018, and we will collect some more field data of the same type in summer 2019 in Green Bay at the Aeronet OC site. The last slide shows one of our additional projects. We are actually currently looking at the remote sensing of the Lake Superior near shore. And the image shows the retrieval of the total suspended matter concentration in the Lake Superior near shore from a Landsat image from July 2014. The image was processed with a CC2RCC processor in the ESA SNAP, SNAP software. And it shows the distribution of the TSM pretty accurately. There was some offset in the magnitude of the data. It was a very small offset though, and we will process more images to see if we look at any sort of systematic offset there. And the objective of this project is to um, identify the extent of the Lake Superior near shore region, depending on the distribution of TSM and the water temperature in this region. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Girl, and that was a really interesting talk, and I'm excited to see more of the data products and to visit the website that you listed. Next up, I'd like to introduce Dr. Amita Mehta, who has been my co-instructor on this uh, webinar series. It's been really wonderful working with her, and she has put together a demonstration of Landsat uh, data, Landsat 8 OLI, to download and to process it through atmospheric correction and to derive level two products. So, Amita, please take it away. This is a brief demonstration, and the objective is to prepare for an exercise that you will be conducting next week. The exercise will focus on comparing Landsat derived chlorophyll A concentration with in situ measurements of the same quantity in selected lakes in Wisconsin. We will talk about the in situ data next week, but the demonstration today will include uh, downloading Landsat 8 operational land imager level 1 data using USGS Earth Explorer, and we will focus on a specific tile that is on Wisconsin covering small lakes where in situ measurements are taken. Next, we will install Ocean Color Science software in CDAS. Some of you may already have installed this, but if not, this is the time to install it, and that helps in processing um, level one images. Finally, we will convert Landsat 8 operational land imager level one data to level two with derived geophysical quantities, and we will also see how to do partial atmospheric correction. So these are the steps. We'll first start with the USGS Earth Explorer. Dr. Sherry Palacios already demonstrated this last week, so we will go through this very quickly. Last week, you had picked a box with latitude and longitude in Gulf of Mexico. Today, we are going to focus on Wisconsin, and we already know path and row of uh, Landsat 8 image that had overlap with in situ measurements. So we are going to enter this path which is 23 and row which is 30. Oh, sorry. And then when you say show, it shows the location where this is. Also, the in situ measurements were taken in 2014 where there was overlap with a Landsat 8 uh, overpass uh, in September 23rd. So we're going to enter this date. 2014, September 23rd. And then you can select data sets. We're going to pick Landsat, Landsat Collection Level 1, and Landsat 8 Level 1 data. 
once you select this criteria you can leave other things as default for now and look at results this shows this footprint shows where this image is the location of the image and clicking on the image you can see uh, level one image and you can see all these small lakes scattered here in Wisconsin once you have this you can go ahead and download this data you can download this as level one geotiff by clicking here it takes a few minutes all about 10 to 15 minutes sometimes depending on the internet speed to download uh, one tile of Landsat 8 data but you can download it which I have already downloaded when you download this file you will get a zip file you will get a zip file and by double clicking on it or using an appropriate software you can have uh, all these unzipped file uh, here So next, we are going to go to CDAS and we are going to install OCSSW. If you already have OCSSW installed, you will see all these links highlighted. If it is not, then you will not have these links highlighted, but you will see here update data processors or installed data processors and you would click on that. Once you click on that, you will see a number of options for different sensors for which science software can be installed. In here we have picked Aqua, Terra and Lenset Oli. By picking this and also you can say clean install so that actually helps in installing the software in error free fashion and then you can run this. Once you run it you will be able to access any of these routines under OCSSW. In OCSSW, we are going to use L2 Gen, which is level 2 generation, that will convert uh, level 1 data to level 2. For, you have multiple options here that we will see some of them, but first thing is to input the file. I file here is the file that you just downloaded and unzipped, uh, that you downloaded from uh, USGS Earth Explorer. This is the unzipped file, and the file that you would use as input is mtl txt file click on that it takes a minute but it appears here this is level one data and it automatically fills this output file name which is process data and this is level two format as you can see this is level two now next thing you would do is check get ancillary data these are the ancillary inputs uh, they are used for atmospheric correction so you need them on next look at the products you have multiple products here you can select multiple products we are going to focus on two things here one is this radiances and reflectances and as you can see all the reflectances remote sensing reflectances are there these are all optical um, blue green red data you can also have infrared uh, near infrared and short wave infrared all these data on if you like and next we're going to look at derived geophysical parameters as I mentioned earlier this particular exercise we will focus on chlorophyll A concentration but you can see that there are other options and at the end of the presentation you have links to go to uh, OCSSW and uh, know what, what all these parameters are so keep everything else as default you can go to processing options and here there are some changes that we have to make uh, for lakes in Wisconsin as we mentioned earlier, CDAS works with ocean color or open ocean data mostly. And so when you are working with inland lakes, which may be small and turbid, uh, there are some things that have to be adjusted to use this. First thing you will do is go to AER opt. This is the aerosol uh, correction for which we are going to turn off. We are going to say no aerosol subtraction um, for small turbid lakes sometimes. Uh, subtraction for aerosol um, 
optical properties that gives errors. So we're going to turn that off. We're going to keep all these parameters as default, but go down and turn this cloud mask off, this hilt off, and land mask off. These masks have resolution which is about 500 meters or so, especially land. So that masks small lakes. So we're going to turn them off for now and use other threshold to, uh, to get mask the land later on. Once you do that, next thing you want to do is go to processing option. And here you will pick two. This is force all pixels to be processed as ocean. This way we make sure that all the small water bodies are up, appear as water bodies. After doing that, you can run this. You can also explore other, these are the thresholds for different parameters that you can change. For now, we're going to um, leave them as default. Things change with different cases, but we're going to keep these options as they are for now. Here, there's also something to note that these are the coefficients for um, different parameters and for chlorophyll also. What happens is these are ocean color coefficients, but if you have your own coefficients based on other in situ data, then you can enter them here and use them to calculate products. But we're going to leave everything else uh, as is and then go back and run this. I already have run this. So I'm going to, because when you, two things, installing OCSSW and also running this will take a long time. It will be, when you process this, it may take up to half hour sometimes. So uh, you will be doing it um, between now and next week for the image that you will be working next week. So I'm going to cancel this now and I'm going to open the file that I have already processed. So this is level two data that was generated by using level one data that we downloaded from USGS Earth Explorer just a few minutes ago. Once it loads in a few seconds, you will see all the rasters here. You will see multiple options that we kept in the products in OCSSW. This is aerosol, aerosol optical thickness. You see deflectances chlorophyll A, this is attenuation coefficient. We're going to focus on chlorophyll A concentration. So by clicking on that, you can get the raster image up here in the main window. Once the image is loaded, you will see that this is Lake Superior, this is Lake Winnebago, and there are small lakes here everywhere. But we treated all these land pixels also as ocean pixels or water pixels. So that's why you see all these. What we're going to do now is go to Mask Manager here and turn on this Cloud Eyes Mask On. That uses a threshold based on near infrared uh, reflectances. So because land appears bright compared to um, all the water bodies, it masks land nicely, although it says it's cloud mask. Basically, we're kind of making sure that only thing we see is water bodies here by masking land using that threshold that is usually used for clouds. And so here you can see all these small lakes visible. We are going to focus on in situ data of two lakes in here. But for now, um, this is what uh, we wanted to do. So this ends the demonstration. You will go through this same steps for your homework. Uh, you can download the homework from our website and it guides you step by step to get an image for 1st September 2015, for which also we have in situ data in some lakes. And then you will go through the same process and get chlorophyll A concentration map for that particular day and that particular tile. So that is going to be the homework. Next week, when you come in, you will be using that image 
in CDAS, you will open the image and then we will do some processing. We will get in situ data in here and then compare um, Landsat based chlorophyll A concentration and uh, in situ data. So that is going to be the next week, but because it depends on your image processing this week, your homework is very important. Um, so that ends today's demonstration. This is a homework two. And th you will be doing this homework in preparation for the exercise that you will be doing next week. So the objectives here are first install um, this ocean color software in CDAS uh, for processing Landsat 8 OLE images, and that is to convert level one to level two. So we'll download, just as you saw in the demonstration, you will be downloading Landsat OLE level one image for uh, a different date than we saw today. And then you will also convert that to level two data. And then we will do further processing next week. We are focusing this on, again, Wisconsin, but these are two different lakes that we'll be looking at than what we saw today in the demo. This uh, homework, you will find step-by-step -step instruction in a document which you can download from the webinar website, or you can go on our set website and download this document. And please follow all the steps so that um, you can have installed OCSSW in CDAS. Um, also, you can download Lancet image for a particular date, which is 1st September 2015, and then you convert that uh, using um, OCSSW. So next week, when you come in for the webinar, you will have a level two image uh, for a given tile here it's given the path and row are given here and uh, this is what you will have so there is nothing to submit for your homework this week you just will come back with a corrected level two image and then we will work further in class during the webinar session with this data so please follow these steps you can download this document uh, from our set website again or from the webinar um, file section and then um, we we will work with you next week once you have this image so thank you all right thank you Amita that was really interesting and I hope our participants get a lot out of that uh, demonstration that you just gave next up we're gonna open the floor for questions from our participants. Um, you'll see in the questions area of the browser uh, that you're using for the webinar, uh, a box where you can type in your questions. And if you haven't already been doing so during the webinar series um, and today's webinar, please do so now. We're really interested in being able to answer your questions. Online will be Dr. Gerlin, Dr. Amita Mehta, and myself. And we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Uh, you guys have provided some really great questions, and I'm excited we have such an active set of participants. Um, it's really cool learning about some of your projects as you post them, uh, fisheries in Indonesia, uh, minerals in the Salton Sea, uh, forests, uh, small lake systems and forest systems. And um, so thank you. Uh, we really appreciate you guys participating. I see here that uh, Dr. Meta Amita is online now. Good morning, Amita, or afternoon, I think, where you might be. Yes, hi everyone. And um, so we're going to start off here. I just a uh, couple of administrative things before we have um, Dr. Gerlin on. Uh, a couple of people have asked, um, are there going to be step-by-step -step instructions going through um, the demo and exercise? And yes, these are provided to you in the handouts. And if they're not currently in the handout section here, they will be on the website. So please go to the website link and look for those handouts there if you don't see them here. We've taken a slight kind of a hybrid approach this time on being very general with some of our instructions and being very specific with other sets of instructions. Um, those survey questions that you guys answer at the end of the course are really important to us to understand what do you guys prefer? Because we really respond to what you guys want. We wanna provide trainings that are really useful to the community. Um, how detailed do you want those instructions to be? With the understanding, of course, that you know software changes, and so some of those instructions may become a little obsolete over time. But the, the idea is there is we want to provide a service to you that is meaningful. Um, we get a lot of in, uh, uh, information from our uh, 
participants during the survey or during the surveys. And so, as I mentioned earlier in this presentation, uh, Dr. Gerlin actually reached out to us as a part of the survey, and then it became some interviews and more questions. And um, then she ended up becoming a guest speaker because we were so excited about the work that she does. I have a few questions before we launch into all of this. And Amita, by all means, please, I'll make sure to close my mouth and please jump in and ask questions as well. Um, yeah, one, I want to thank uh, Daniela. Uh, she has given us very graciously all the in situ data that we are going to analyze next week. So the image that we just demoed this week, we downloaded, and the one that you will download for your homework, we will analyze in situ data for those images, like those image over past. So thanks, Daniela, for that. Yeah, thank you, Daniela. It means a lot to our set. Um, so one of the questions we have is, what was the motivation for this water quality monitoring program that you guys have and using remote sensing for it? Um, okay, I think I tried to type it into the um, online document. And in Wisconsin, we have almost 18,000 lakes. So it's practically impossible to monitor all of these lakes with traditional water sampling, water quality monitoring techniques, where someone actually has to go to travel to a lake and collect water samples. And I think that's where the idea for the remote sensing work comes from. And this data currently supplements the traditional measurements. It's used for the identification of trends in water quality, and it's used to plan future monitoring activities if we see any changes in specific lakes. And the idea is that the water clarity is a very simple measure of water quality, and while it still provides some important information about each lake in the state. Mm -hmm. Wow. And how long has it been going on? Since 1999, the project started with a research project at the University of Wisconsin-Madison from 1999 to 2001. And I think there was a gap of one year afterwards, and then the Wisconsin DNR continued to process the data and the image processing protocols were always slightly updated over time. And I think the next step is to maybe move the image processing to Google Earth Engine. Oh, 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 great. Oh, that's cool. Um, and how long have you been a part of the program? Since 2014. Oh, wow. Okay. Nice. Um, do you guys do more than just, uh, do you guys do more than this program? Because this program sounds like a lot of work. Um, but I know that when we talked to you guys, talked to you a while back, it sounds like you do so much more. And I'm curious what you do. This program is actually only a small part of my work, and we collected Steve Krepp. He is currently with the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And Steve and I, we collected data for probably about 24 Wisconsin lakes in 2014 and 2015. We collected radiometric measurements on these lakes. We collected laboratory measurements of the absorption coefficients for these lakes and then standard quality measurements. And we intend to use this data to develop algorithms for the remote sensing of Clover A and TSS in particular, and maybe CDOM. And in addition to this, we share the data with partners or people which are interested in the data to use it for global algorithm development, since it's really much easier for us to use final remote sensing pro products and to process the images ourselves. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> you guys do a lot. Um, so uh, in 2017, we had a harmful algal bloom webinar series, and we had a guest speaker from the Cyan project that's um, based in the USA, uh, the EPA um, agency. And um, this guest speaker told us about the program. So if our participants are interested in learning more about that, I think it was during session three or four, we had the guest speaker for that. And with the type of work that you guys do there in Wisconsin, I was curious, are you affiliated with the Cyan um, project or do you work with them in some way? Um, we are not affiliated with the Cyan project. We work with them to, in some way though, and we actually we tested the cell phone app the project developed and provided feedback for this. And our harmful algae bloom specialist uses the cell phone app from time to time when she, um, receives um, questions related to specific lakes. And we try to integrate the products uh, provided by the Scion project in our current monitoring work. Mm -hmm. And what we're interested in there is to calculate the areas of algae blooms and to calculate the intensity and the onset of algae blooms to see which lakes across the state out of these 18,000 lakes 
have potentially harmful algae blooms and at what times of the year they develop. Mm -hmm. And then we collected some radiometric data and again standard water quality data um, in summer 2018. And we will share this data with the Scion project and some additional projects um, for their validation efforts. Mm -hmm. Do you use volunteers or citizen scientists in the efforts that you guys do? Yeah, the um, we for the all the or most of the water clarity measurements they are collected by um, citizen scientists, and then some citizen scientists collect additional water chemistry measurements. And we had a project to collect water samples for the analysis of water color and sedum in 2000. For 13, 14, and 15, we didn't have much luck with the um, Landsat images for these years in terms of cloud cover. So, and we might revive this at some point in time in the future mm -hmm. with the additional Sentinel-2 data we have today. Mm -hmm. Do you find the tools that you, the links that you provided, um, do you get feedback from people on the what, people who are using those links for the tools, um, your visualization tools? I don't really get feedback for them. What mm -hmm. we did last year was that I presented a poster at the Wisconsin Lakes Partnership um, Conference in Stevens Point, which is an annual conference where people from all aspects of water quality monitoring and volunteers come together. And uh, we had some tablets there with us. And we had people um, basically look at the tablets and look at their lakes and People are typically excited to see their lake. And I always waited for somebody to tell me that the water clarity estimates were way off for this <laughs> lake. And people were typically happy and they were either right on or fairly close for the lakes people looked at. One of the things I really like about the link and the tool that you have is it seems like it's something that our participants could go and view it and think about how they might be able to implement it in their region. And so we were really excited that you provided that information at the end of your talk. And what I would tell our participants is that to, um, the talks are a part of the, dem the video that will be available online and also in the PDF. So if you weren't able to write down or type in that link address, to please go and visit um, Dr. Girl and the links that she provided in her presentation. Um, so Danielle, one of the questions I have is, do you use hyperspectral or imaging spectrometry data in your work? Any of these high resolution data? Yeah, I currently don't use it in my work. I used ESA Eagle data in my work for my PhD. And we currently only use the data that we can get for free. So it's the Landsat data and Sentinel data, of course. And I can recommend to use hyperspectral data if you have access to it. And mm -hmm. I can, for the whole full state of Wisconsin, it makes it a little of a challenge to fly over all these lakes and collect hyperspectral aircraft data. If you're looking at a river system, that might be something really you really want to look at. So. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. And then I, I know I'm throwing a ton of questions. And I want to pause for a moment and ask if Amita has any questions before I ask one of these last ones that I personally have. No, I think you covered everything, Sherry, if I think of something. Okay. okay. Um, so another question I have is you're working in these small lake systems, and often we get questions from participants coming in about using drones or UAV or UAS uh, in their work. And um, so I'm curious because I work in the coastal ocean and I'm looking at large scale processes. So for the type of work that you're doing in these smaller lake systems, do you use drones in your work or do you know if there's a plan in the future to use drones in your region? And this question goes to Daniela. But we may have lost her audio. Oops, sorry, I turned my mic That's off. Okay. That's okay. <laughs> I have two of them. Anyway, I, I currently use, don't use drones in my work, and I haven't looked at their use for a while. The use of drones comes up from time to time, and I've all have to check back on the status of the official Wisconsin ENR policies for this. So there are a lot of regulations involved if you're a state agency. And for me, there uh, they would be applicable for certain projects when we look at specific lakes, but but I normally look at the lakes in the full state. So that is, again, something where the coverage of drones, spatial coverage of drones wouldn't really work 
for this type of work, but I would rec recommend to use them if you um, have access to them, if your company policies or government policies make it possible to use them, and if they work for the spatial, or if their spatial coverage works for your areas of interest. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, a question came up for you from one of our participants, and it's question 10 on the um, document here. It's, uh, what is the purpose for building of mosaic rasters for images from the same image acquisition dates? Um, I always combine the um, images from the same image acquisition dates, which is up to three different images for the same pass, since there are areas of overlap, and that way I basically end up with only one water clarity estimate per pixel and instead of two estimates for each pixel in the overlapping areas, which I would have to average somehow later on. And then and later on I actually calculate the average water clarities for the full lake, so that is very practical at the end. And then we have the advantage that the weather systems in Wisconsin typically move from west to east. And we have only relatively small differences in the atmospheric conditions from north to south, so it doesn't really affect the quality of the data in a bad way. This mm -hmm. might be very different for different regions, of course. Okay, okay. Um, so uh, instead of me asking you a question, I'm wondering if you have any words of wisdom or advice for our participants online who are working in inland systems on designing or developing or being a part of a water quality monitoring program that uses remote sensing? Like a big picture, any advice? Um, let's see. I would, if you're starting out, I would possibly keep it simple. The water clarity is something that you can retrieve from virtually every satellite. And it's something that's cheap to measure because you only have to provide people who measure in the field with a disk and they can use it again and again. It's, so it's much cheaper than any actual water quality analysis where you have to send samples to the lab. I would encourage to um, engage citizen scientists to collect data on image acquisition dates. People in Wisconsin are typically very excited to collect the satellite data and they make sure they will collect data on the correct day. We actually send out a calendar for them on which dates the satellites will come over their specific lake and their path, so they can look up their path and then see the dates for their lake. And then, even though I presented the work with two commercial software packages, there are a lot of free software packages out there that perform basically the same image processing tasks. So there are many ways you can process the data and come to um, higher, high quality results. And then, let's see, I forgot the last thing I wanted to say. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. So I'm going to um, give you a break, Daniela, because I'm kind of putting you on the hot seat, and I didn't really give you a warning before we started today. So thank you uh, for talking to us about this. Um, a question has come in on number two, but I'm going to give you a break, and I'm going to just address some of the other questions that have come in from our participants. If you don't mind uh, helping us out and maybe answering that number two in the document, and then I'll come back and ask you after I've addressed some of these other questions. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so one of the questions that came in was, is it possible to use CDAS on Windows OS? And the answer to that is yes, in a limited form. Um, you can use it for a lot of the image processing tools that we're gonna be talking about that we did in part one and that we are going to cover in part three. Um, the, if you're going to be using the OCSSW processors, it's required that you use this additional tool that they've just implemented called the CDAS OCSSW client server configuration. And a number of people have um, put into the questions that we're having problems accessing this, and we're aware of this, and we've contacted the CDAS team, and we're going to work with them on this. The data that um, the demonstration that um, Amita provided today, um, those data will be available to download, so you're going to be able to use the data. So you're not going to need to use these processors to um, to do part three, um, but um, we would like for you to to try to access this and give it a try and do the homework. So don't panic if you don't have those data by next week. It will be available for you on the website in the processed form. So maybe I've preempted, yes, please do your homework, but the data actually will be available to you. So don't please don't panic. 
Another question came up, um, let's see, um, if we found a difference between field data and remote sensing data, what's the best solution for it? Um, just to see, okay. Um, so this gets at the heart of the question of doing validation of in situ and remote sensing data. And I'm really happy to see this question come up because Amnita is covering this in the exercise in part three. So please hold on until part three. Dr. Gerlin here online has provided very kindly, has provided in situ data for us to work with to practice trying to do a validation um, on the data using CDAS and also putting that data, the in-situ data into a CBAS format, S-E-A-B-A-S-S format, so that um, you can do it within the CDAS software. Um, a question came up about using CDAS for high spectral resolution images. And um, so while the webinar series was happening, I wasn't sure of the answer of this, so I sent a text message to my um, colleague, Dr. Vanderwood, who works with hyperspectral imagery. We work on it together. And um, because I wasn't sure if CDAS has started supporting high spectral resolution imagery. And she was told in a recent um, hyperspectral uh, workshop that CDAS will soon start supporting high spectral imagery, high spectral resolution imagery. Um, because I'm still just learning about this, I want to go to the CDAS team and confirm that this is the case, that it's actually in the release and not the beta, and if it's in the GUI or is it in the um, command line version only. So I will provide an updated answer to this in the online question and answer when I complete the answers to this. So if it's not in the part one question and answer when you look for this, or excuse me, if it's not in part two, today's question and answer, it will be in the part three question and answer because it may take a few days for me to get a response from the CDAS team. Another question came up about using a Landsat Collection 1 Level 2 data, and if it's um, the data that's available from the USGS Earth Explorer, and is it considered inappropriate for water quality monitoring? And the, we'd like to note that the USGS Collection of Landsat Level 2 data are more valid for the land surface. The atmospheric correction for when the water surface is done differently using the OCSSW processors, and it's better for water quality. So um, we just barely touch on atmospheric correction in this webinar series. You could do an entire webinar series just on atmospheric correction. Um, and if you're really into atmospheric correction, it can be kind of fun um, to think about the math and what's going on in the atmosphere and the path of the photons and everything. Um, but we just kind of uh, just kind of provide just an outline or a sketch of what's involved with it. And so when you deal with coastal systems or offshore systems, you have different atmospheric components, aerosols, water vapor, relative humidity, then you may have over for inland um, bodies of water, so which are going to have atmospheric constituents that are comprised of continental sources. And so there are considerations that you need to take into, um, take into play uh, when you do this atmospheric correction so that you are aware of, okay, what, is the what are the correct inputs that we're going to use for this atmospheric correction? And sometimes you may, like with Amita, just remove the aerosol constituents and remove the aerosol model so that you just are not even going to include that part of it. So it may seem a little bit subjective and there is a component of it that is subjective. You, you need to know your area and you need to have an understanding of what's in the atmosphere. And that's possible using information that you can get from the Aeronet system that will provide some information that can be useful. It's A-E-R-O-N-E-T, if you're not already familiar with it, um, that you can use when you use the OCSSW processors, you can use information from the Aeronet system to provide more detail in the choices that you make and the parameters that you include in atmospheric correction. Um, Again, we could do a whole webinar series on atmospheric correction, but I, I don't think that that's the uh, a primary objective of the RSET trainings. So perhaps maybe an in-person training would be more appropriate, like a one-day workshop or two-day. Um, Daniela, I'd like to check in with you to see if you'd like to um, help us out with that question number two. Uh, what are the main variables that are taken in a body of water to apply an adjustment and the correlation with images of OLI. Okay, I wasn't really sure about the term adjustment and what we are typically collect on a Landsat image acquisition dates when we're in the field are radiometric measurements and then water samples. 
and we would use the radiometric measurements to compare them to atmospherically corrected satellite data for the dates of interest. And that is true for some of our research efforts on small and smaller areas and then specific lakes. And if you want to keep it really simple to start out with, you can collect only SACIDEPS data since it's very cheap and easy to collect. And then you could add additional constituents of at a later point in time. TSS is something that you can retrieve from Landsat 8 data. And then I would probably move to Sentinel to MSI data for additional constituents like chlorophyll A. Since Sentinel 2 would have the spectral bands required for the remote sensing of chlorophyll A, this might look a little different if your lakes continually continuously have extremely high chlorophyll A concentrations, then you might be able to use Landsat 8 for the remote sensing of chlorophyll A. So it really depends on your lakes. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. I appreciate you answering that. This, um, As you were talking about SECI depth data and you touched on using citizen science and using the Cyan um, app, do you use any other like um, phone apps, smartphone apps for measuring water surfaces? Or have you used any of the ones that are out there? I know of two, but um, and three if you include the Cyan tool. Uh, no, we don't use any of these okay. apps. We only use the Cyan app at the moment. Okay. Okay. Yeah, there's one that um, I don't know if it's still active that will give you information about SECI depth. And um, there's another one that will provide an estimate of remote sensing reflectance using the smartphone camera. So um, I don't know uh, if they're both active still or, or what, but um, okay. So I'm gonna address a couple more questions that came in. Um, and again, um, we really are excited that the participants are, are so actively asking us these questions. Uh, please uh, use that question um, portion of the webinar control panel, but I, I think we're going to wrap it up pretty soon. Uh, one of the questions that came in is, can we calculate bathymetry using CDAS tools? And there's a link to a YouTube video that you can watch on this that will be provided in this document, the question and answer document for part two. And um, Amita, I think you are, are quickly, or maybe it's Brock, quickly putting in all of this, these answers here. Um, so thanks for finding that YouTube link and putting it in there. So that'll be available to you. And then um, can we validate results of satellite data if we don't have the in situ measurements? And the answer is you need those in situ data to validate. Um, and if you're gonna be working on developing an algorithm, you absolutely need to have in situ data and you actually need to have a lot of data. And I think Daniela, how many in situ values did you, you told us it was like, I think it was like over 600 in situ values or something yes. like that. Yes, there are yeah. actually a lot more values collected. Some of them are just under clouds, so and so we can't really use them. And I think there are probably uh, more, maybe two to three thousand in situ water clarity values collected throughout the whole summer. And this is by citizen scientists and by different DNR monitoring programs. And the 600 and something values that I mentioned, these were the ones that I actually used for the algorithm calibration. Mm -hmm. That's an extensive amount of work. Um, so for a quantitative and, validation, you need those yeah. in situ values. Yeah, and something to add to that is that a lot of the citizen scientists, they actually live at the lakes. There are a lot of retirees and they collect these data at their lakes. So we try hmm. to encourage a lot of locals to participate in these efforts. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. I mean, it, it gets to the heart of citizen science. If you get the citizens to love and be passionate about their system, they'll want to support efforts to maintain it and monitor it. And something good about that is that citizens actually see that the um, data products are used for something. They're used for the integrated reports to Congress. So before, at some point in time, I, re I received a question from somebody and he asked if I would make more than a pretty map when he looked at our online viewers. So I could actually tell them, yes, we use this data for important reports and traffic state assessments of their lakes. Mm -hmm. Wow, that is so cool. Thank you, Dr. Gerlin, so much for participating in this webinar series. Um, we really couldn't have done it without you and we are very grateful. So thank you, we appreciate it. This yeah, has no come problem. to the... We're, yeah. Um, so we've come to the end of the questions that we're going to answer during this series. And if you'll notice, we're ending about a half hour early. So we'll give back a little time from last week. 
Um, so uh, we're gonna go ahead and wrap it up. We wanna remind you that you have homework assignments that are due by June 21st. The exercise or the demonstration that Amita provided for you, we want you to download the data that you had um, that she walked through with you with the Earth Explorer. And we will be meeting again next week. And we want to remind you that next week we have a very, very full day of lecture, demonstration, and exercises. And then with the time that is um, available after we've completed our online demonstrations of the exercises, it will be a quiet laboratory work time for you to, to complete the exercises. That's optional. You don't have to stay on for that, but we welcome you to stay on because Amita and I will get on and answer questions as, as needed. So we'll, we'll do it in incrementally. We won't do it constantly throughout the time. Um, again, this is one of those things that we're kind of testing out different ways of doing things with RSET. And so uh, we have been really excited to be able to have a guest speaker and then the interview on the spot and you guys providing questions for our guest speaker. We also would like feedback on the materials and how detailed we're providing information and materials step by step or, or an overview. And we're testing out this idea of this quiet laboratory time, if that's something that works well for you. We like to get feedback so that we can improve our trainings into the future. So this concludes part two of our webinars, of the webinar series of using remote, integrating remote sensing into a water quality monitoring program. We look forward to seeing you online again next week, and we really appreciate your enthusiasm and the time that you're giving to learn more about using remote sensing for water quality monitoring. Thank you.